Hello everyone, this is Dr. Zenu Gordon and uh, I am a nationally certified school psychologist and a licensed school psychologist in the state of Illinois. Today we are going to be talking about gifted and talented learners. Is my child gifted and talented or is my student gifted and talented? Before we dive into this brief presentation, I want to highlight a few key points. Gifted and talented students are from all countries. They are of different races, cultural backgrounds, and socioeconomic statuses, meaning they are from families of all classes. Gifted students need to be identified, assessed, and then provided comprehensive support and differentiation to the curriculum so that they can reach their fullest potential. So this suggests that gifted students who receive acceleration and enrichment are more successful than those who are denied such opportunities. There are disparities in gifted and talented programs um, in the United States um, and in Illinois to be specific, the state that I am at, which since gifted and talented students are from all countries or from all backgrounds, then there should not be such disparity. But that's going to be for another um, presentation. The purpose of this presentation is to spread awareness of giftedness and offer guidance on how to support gifted students to meet their fullest potential. So what is giftedness? Giftedness is described as a student who gives evidence of high achievement capacities in areas such as intellectual, creative artistic, or leadership capacities, or in specific academic fields, and who needs services or activities not ordinarily provided by the school in order to fully develop those capabilities. And that's coming from the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001. Giftedness can also be described as a student with superior intellectual capacity and the potential to perform exceptionally well compared to same age peers in a similar environment and with similar experiences. Gifted and talented students often stand out. Parents and educators often notice something different about the student, whether it is their level of reasoning, their intense questioning, hyperactivity, uh, their sense of humor, outstanding creativity, or even their leadership skills. Even though a student is gifted, like all other students, whether in the general education or special education classroom, factors such as motivation, interest, self-perceptions, homeschool collaboration, peers and, so peers and society may impact their success. So it's a very important that these students are identified and supported. So what are some characteristics of gifted students? And these are some common characteristics as there are way more, but these are grouped. And one of the main ones is high intelligence. Gifted and talented students have excellent memory, strong problem solving ability, strong verbal reasoning skills, in that how they're able to use vocabulary to express their thoughts and ideas and perceptions uh, very well, very complex vocabulary at uh, times. These students, when, um, they are, when they're assessed using cognitive assessments, uh, they normally score high, normally standard scores in, um, at or above 130, which represents the highest in the second percentile. These students enjoy problem solving, especially with numbers and puzzles, often self-taught reading and writing skills as preschoolers. They have advanced comprehension of word nuances, uh, metaphors, and, const and un um, abstract ideas. They have a tendency to be inquisitive, they experiment and explore. So they ask unusual questions and 
engage in exploratory behaviors uh, directed to elicit information about situations, device, or material. Very curious mind. They're, they also have keen sense of humor, very keen sense of humor. They pick up on humor very well and their humor can be gentle and it can be hostile for some. It can be sometimes sarcastic, but very humorous, um, you know, these students. Very creative and vivid imagination. They have many original ideas and show exceptional ingenuity in using everyday materials. They are fluent producers of ideas and have high developed curiosity. So these students are also strong. They have strong academic skills, rapid learners. They put thoughts together quickly and they break down some really complex concepts that sometimes it's even hard for adults to break down. So they're very, very smart minds, um, these students. They're way more characteristics, as mentioned. And um, some of these you can definitely find on the National Association of Gifted uh, Children website. And that's going to be in the reference page if you want to go and read more on some of these characteristics that are mentioned. So now that we know the characteristics of a gifted student, let us look at this scenario with Teresa. Teresa is a student in the third grade at Applewood School. She's been scoring A's on all her tests. On reading activities, she provides detailed responses to, comprehensive, to complex comprehension questions and has an impeccable vocabulary to express her thoughts on oral presentations. Her math calculation and problem solving skills are equally strong and she grasps learning concepts quickly. She is always the first student to complete in-class activities and tests and then walk around the room while other students are working. She, is like, she likes to talk to her best friend, Sally, and Sally is sometimes frustrated because she's still working. The teacher thinks Teresa is very competitive and mischievous and often sends her to the principal's office. At the principal's office, Teresa talks about books she's reading, asks the principal thought-provoking questions about what she read, and engages him in complex discussions. When the principal called home, the parent indicated that Teresa struggles with inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. The mother is worried that she that this may impact her completing projects when she is in other grades. Let's think about that for a while. And then answer these or answer the questions. Um, based on the scenario, do you realize characteristics of giftedness? And what characteristics of giftedness have you realized? And you can provide some of these feedbacks in the form of a comment, or you may, if you feel, email some of these to me so we can have dialogue about some of these things. But yes, based on the scenario, um, Teresa did display characteristics of giftedness. Teresa um, is showing really strong skills and it's clear that the school is not providing her with the appropriate supports that she needs. Uh, there should have been ongoing consultation with home and school about Teresa's learning needs and Teresa should be referred for gifted assessment and a determination made on whether she is gifted and underachieving or gifted and exceptional, meaning she has dual exceptionalities and that could maybe be ADHD along with giftedness or as said, probably gifted and underachieving because she's not in a learning environment that is catering to her needs. And so it could also be that she's gifted 
and she probably has a specific learning disability. So it's vast, many things are possible, and so why she needs to be assessed to find out what is the best learning environment for her, what's the best placement for her, and what are some of the learning needs that she has. Something that is very critical um, in this scenario as well is that home and school collaboration is of importance for any student to excel but in this presentation for gifted students to excel it is important that there is ongoing home school collaboration so we've identified that Teresa the student needs assessment but then if we're to look in a general school setting what is the process of identifying these students? How do we know what supports and services these students need? And so one of the first steps is to screen students. And in screening students, this can be observation in the classroom by the classroom teacher, looking at how the student is responding to questions maybe, looking at the student's test scores, um, seeing how the student performs on criterion reference tests, um, seeing how the student is, you know, the, the, the speed in which the student is completing uh, or the fluency in which the student is completing tests. Also using checklists um, to see if the student is demonstrating characteristics of a gifted child. And these checklists can be completed by parents or they can be completed by teachers. And there are many gifted and talented checklists uh, that are there. And so different districts, different schools, different countries have different ways of identifying their gifted students. Based on the region you are watching from, this presentation is to help you to identify the process as it should be similar in all locations, screening, assessment, placement. But varied checklists or sorry, or varied screening tools that can be used to identify gifted students would be um, such as the, the GATES, the Gifted and Talented Evaluation Scale. There is also the Gifted Evaluation Scale. There is also the scale for rating the behavioral characteristics of superior students. And there's also the Gifted Rating Scale. And so there are many other scales that can be used, but I just wanted to name a few scales that could be used to assess um, or to screen a student if they need further assessment. And then if a student is screened and we see that they are having many uh, characteristics of a gifted child, then we assess. And so these assessments are conducted at times by trained uh, professionals this could be a school psychologist, an educational psychologist, or based on the district or the country, different persons may be assigned based on whatever certifications or skills that they have. But from a school psychologist perspective, in assessing for giftedness, uh, we would look at the cognitive skills, the academic skills, and just do a comprehensive look at the child. So some social emotional components as well, as well as adaptive skills. And so in looking at the cognitive abilities, we want to see is a student having a, a full scale IQ um, of maybe say 120 and above or 130 and above, depending on the criteria. As again, each district has different um, criteria. And so um, the eligibility for giftedness may be different, but most times, um, and based on research, a uh, standard score of 130 in terms of IQ is the cognitive capacity or intelligence that's needed to be qualified for a gifted program. And then some form of academic assessment is done and this can be done using some standardized um, norm reference uh, batteries or assessment such as the KTA the Kaufman test of educational 
um, achievement, um, also the Wyatt, and there are many other tools that can be used, just to name a few. However, the person doing the assessment will look at all pieces of the evaluation because it's not just one piece that will make that determination. But when we are assessing, we have to look on all pieces of the evaluation, the full child, to make a determination as to what the learning needs are for that student. And so thereafter, a determination is made and then um, something similar to an individualized education plan is developed for that student. Again, in each district, in each state, in each country, this may look different. Um, I remember in Florida, there would be um, a plan that's created um, for students similar to an IEP, but not, not called an, um, an individual education plan but it's another plan that's created to provide students these services. And then in Texas and in Illinois, the practices are different. So it varies depending on where the, the, the person is and the procedural um, safeguard or the procedure for doing such assessments in that area that the person is. And then we go to placement. After the student is identified as being a gifted student, we want to ensure that the student is placed, whether they are staying in their classroom or we're going to provide them with other opportunities um, to ensure that they're getting the services and meeting their needs, then a team would sit down to decide what the student needs um to excel and of course the parents should always be at the table because the parent would know their child best in the home setting or whatever setting parents are always experts when it comes on to their child so they should always be at a discussion table to talk about the needs and supports that their child is going to be receiving and as said earlier it is always important that we have ongoing consultation collaboration uh, relationship between home and school because when home and school are consistently working together the results are even far significantly better for a child um, to do well now some of the supports that can take place are differentiating classroom instruction and this is a main one this is the main one students can stay in their exact classrooms that they're in but with differentiated classroom instructions they can thrive and so um, this can be done by providing tiered assessments or assignments uh, self-directed learning and seminars so the teacher of that particular class would then ensure um, she or he you know take a very good look at what the students needs are in the classroom and then decide how to provide um, instruction that would cater to that particular student's need and then accelerated curriculum is another one so this is kind of feeding the student based on their needs so the student is working fast the student is grasping the concept the student when given assessment is showing competency so we kind of put them in a fast pace kind of learning approach. So fast paced presentation of the curriculum. So we call that now accelerated curriculum. So feed them with information. They're showing the interest. They are showing the competency. We go along with the flow. So they're motivated and they're, they're continuous learners and they're doing their best. So we continue to feed them with the information that they crave for. And so um, they can achieve the goal, maybe at a faster pace. But we want to know they're not sitting in a classroom and they're not bored. So we give them all that information that they need. Another one is advanced placement. So students um, in the high school who are gifted and talented may take college level classes in the high school. Um, and so this is challenging them because something that is important is that we challenge gifted students. And sometimes it happens that students are not very challenged in their classrooms and so their behavior, um, the behavior is a problem because they're bored. Um, they become hyperactive, they start 
having conflicts, that all sorts of other stuff. So we want to ensure that we always rule out that the students is challenged. And so we give them instruction that's meeting them just where they are. So advanced placement is one, giving high school students um, college level classes or elementary students middle school classes and you know wherever they are we give them instruction for um, higher grade levels depending on you know the situation that we're in another one is honors honors classes and um, these are classes that are specially created for students who are doing exceptionally well, superior knowledge, they're showing superior skills in a particular class. So these are special classes created for those students and they take honors classes. That's something that can be done. And these students can also receive these supports in the same classroom as everyone else is in. So there's not always the need to remove the student from a particular classroom. The student can stay in that same setting and receive supports and services. Another one is internship. It's very important when students are showing strong intellectual skills, giftedness in music, artistic, however it is, we put them on internship, give them that skill, give them the practice that they need. Um, this is also helping them to make a choice from early what career they want to go in, um, to decide um, and to realize that we're motivating them. They feel motivated, they feel encouraged to grow further, to improve on their skill that they have. Um, so internship really helps uh, for training as well as it helps to, you know, help the child to create um, or decide on what career they would be interested in. And then another one is concurrent enrollment. So this is pretty much the child is enrolled in high school and college classes at the same time. So while taking high school, there can be partnership with universities and schools where the child is benefiting from both. So a child maybe in the 10th grade may be taking um, math courses in college. And then eventually when the child does get to college, then it can be shorter for the child. Um, you know, again, kind of putting the child at a faster pace um, to kind of meet them where they're at. So very important. And this one is sometimes common. And this is grade skipping. So having the child uh, skip a grade. So they're doing so well. Say for instance, uh, Teresa, the scenario we're giving, Teresa is showing competency already in the third grade, mastering all the third grade standards or objectives and goals. So maybe start giving her the fourth grade information. Um, when there are some classes, the classes that she's probably strongest in, have her join the fourth grade class to, um, you know, or even collect fourth grade materials from that particular teacher and then have Teresa work on those materials um, during her reading block or reading class. And then the next one is grade telescoping. And this is kind of similar to grade skipping, but it permits uh, the student to progress through the grades rapidly and may spend less time in a particular school. So for instance, in the Jamaican setting, we have primary school, high school. So in the primary school, a child, when we refer to grade telescoping, it means that a child can be doing so well that they spend less time. We normally have six years in primary school. It may be less than that a child spend in a primary school. Move on to other setting and um, to do well. So that's, that's another strategy that can be used in terms of placement. Now, with these placements, it's important that, um, you know, this discussions are held with a team. As again, it's very important that parent is, a, is at the table because something that is common is that gifted students, though intellectually they are super smart, they're doing well or they're talented in a particular area, they still have same needs similar to their same age peers. Most times, social emotionally, they have social emotional needs similar to their same age peers. And it's not always true that gifted and talented students are excelling in 
all academic areas and so may still need some grade level or age level support in that particular um, subject area where they are you know demonstrating that they need that form of support so now that we've looked at um, or talked a little bit about the the UDL approach uh, just wanted to, just want us to kind of look further into it and I've provided a reference and it's going to be on the reference reference page at the end as to how you can get more information about universal design for learning so the UDL framework as I explained earlier includes three principles called calling for educators to provide multiple means of engagement multiple means of presenting uh, instructional content as well as multiple means of action and expression when designing and developing instruction as said before this approach is heavily evidence-based so it's, it works in many settings across many school districts many states very good especially if you have diverse learners in your room that is students um, with other special needs maybe they have a specific learning disability emotional disability intellectual disability all of that all these students can be in one room giftedness all and they can all be meeting their goals can all be achieving reaching their full potential right there with this approach and so this approach is heavily evidence-based and it helps educators to use digital technology as well and innovative methods to teach whole classes while personalizing each student's instruction um, this approach also provides a blueprint for creating flexible instructional goals methods materials and assessment that work for everyone so the UDL approach is very useful when we're talking about supporting the gifted child in the classroom now let's go back to the scenario that we looked at with Teresa and now link Teresa's case to the UDL approach and so as we see Teresa would definitely benefit from supports in a classroom that is using the the UDL approach she would benefit when presented content in different ways so content based on her learning style so if she's doing whatever the, the learning um, objective is knowing if she is a visual auditory tactile whatever learning style is if knowing she's gifted as well so that you can then differentiate instruction um, in a way for her to express what she knows so that may be in Teresa's case since she appears to know so much about the content that is already presented to her kind of differentiating in a way by having multiple choices in the in the in the in the room so students are working on the same objectives whether it is in reading math or science but they have multiple choices to show their understanding of concepts and so in maybe a reading class it could be that all students are required to conduct um, you know to read and to show demonstrate reading comprehension by answering questions it could be then that students are grouped and we call this and this is something that we would call um, tiered assignments or tiered activities you group students um, and then you can have students work on different questions based on what you know of their learning needs and where they are at you give them questions based on those needs that they have and so additionally you can give students who are finished with task opportunity to research 
um, opportunity to use technological devices to look further into whatever concepts are being taught. So say for instance, it's science and you're teaching the students about the skeletal system or the skeletal system, then something that you can do is when you're teaching all the students about the concepts, you can, knowing your students' um, ability, give them um, hints and give them um, probes that are in their, um, you know, in their in their learning need based on their learning needs. So you you you, you adjust and you differentiate the material in such a way that a student is not bored, but that they are improving in whatever knowledge base that they already have. And so it's also important to base on the scenario and the UDL that Teresa is in an environment where she is stimulated. You know, her interests are stimulated. She's motivated um, to learn. So thinking about this time, the relevance of what she's doing in class, the design use, uh, the feedback and the environment in which she is in. So... Those are things that we have to think about when we are working with a child that's gifted. It can be um, lots of things to think about, but it's definitely beneficial for the student to excel and to be motivated in the classroom. So it's about thinking of ways to get them to be more engaged. At times, you may have to just give them opportunity to take a further deep dive into whatever the content is that you're teaching. And so using the... The, um, the UDL, here we have um, some levels in which we can support a student um, in the classroom. So yes, as I said earlier, we may be doing a reading and all the students at first are provided with a general lecture at the level one. All students there um, are given materials, um, are hearing auditory information provided, um, there is a support system in the class where there is probably peer-to-peer -peer interaction. However it is, that's level one. However, we know that there are students like Teresa who are gifted. And there are students as well who are also having some disabilities. So then we need to provide further level two support for those students. And so this may mean that we can group students into tier or we can tier the activities that we're doing so that we can reach these particular students. And then because we know some of our students are gifted or they have disabilities that are so severe, we provide further level three and level four support. So we kind of go to them on a one-to-one -to, -one to provide those answers, that attention, that motivation that they may need to complete whatever the task is that they are expected to do. For older students um, who are receiving some form of leveled support or UDL, some other things that can be done are um, independent studies. Have the students conduct research. Have them do projects. Pretty much put in place uh, ways that they are, uh, you're developing their creative and critical thinking skills or using problem or allow them to use problem solving and decision making strategies so give them research to build their research skills have them do projects that are developing their project management strategies um, and just be engaged in other things based on their learning interests so that they can grow further and improve on these skills and intellectual capacity that they have and they are demonstrating um, in the classroom. And then something that I had mentioned earlier, and it's, this can work with all classrooms, with all students, is ensuring that we are using learning centers. And this can be physical stations where students engage in activities designed to extend their understanding and expand their thinking about certain topics. So this might include um, working on individual or small group investigation. It may include watching a video or listening an audio recording or working on a device. So many options as it relates to learning centers. Something that can also be done is 
games could be used uh, as a reinforcement of a concept. So when a student demonstrate that they understand a concept that you've covered, um, in extending the interest of the student, center might um, not always be related to the direct content that is taught, but is providing some form of reinforcement um, for the student. And it can also be um, a method that's used to introduce the student to um, upcoming concepts that will be taught, um, you know, or introducing the possibility of um, new studies that are coming up. Based on the scenario here, we see that it was said that Teresa, um, when the principal was um, called home, Teresa's mom, our parent, maybe dad as well, they were concerned about inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And it sounds like in the classroom, some of these concerns were coming up. So the teacher here that, you know, she was thinking that Teresa is very competitive and mischievous. If she had had conversation or collaboration with home, she would then hear that there are some form of similarities in both settings. And so it could be possible, could be because there's no assessment yet. It could be possible that Teresa has is, is twice exceptional and by twice exceptional what we mean is that she has a dual exceptionality so it could be that she's gifted and talented as well as she has another uh, as well as she has another exceptionality or a disability like adhd or something else who knows when an assessment would be done then it could be said further um what you know, the learning needs are um, and what approach may work best for the child. So in the meantime, and always useful, the UDL approach is ideal to provide that form of differentiation and enrichment in the classroom for the student to, to excel. So now that we have gone through the scenario, um, Theresa's scenario, and we've gone through using the UDL approach to help her to meet her needs in the classroom, as well as, of course, collaborating with home and school, some other things that can be done to support gifted students. So here, are other things that we can do to ensure that we're supporting these students um, in the school and home setting. Uh, before I go into them, I want to share that even though a student is gifted, again, I want to point out that factors such as motivation, interest, self-perception, home school collaboration, peer and society may impact their success. And so I cannot state it enough that homeschool collaboration is important for these children to do well. Something that I also realize um, as someone from a cultural, culturally diverse background is that a lot of times there are students who are gifted from um, culturally diverse background, but then these students are at times gifted and underachievers or gifted and demonstrating underachievement because there is not that connection going on with home and school. There's not that connection as it relates to the interests, the linguistic and cultural background of the child for them to excel in the learning environment. And so that is something that is essential. Knowing the student's linguistic and cultural background, um, learning about some of those um, cultural pieces or linguistical pieces so that we can meet the child, you know, where they are and provide them the needs so they can excel and reach their fullest potential. But supporting a child, there are some things that we can continue to do is by creating a stimulating learning environment that allow self-directed learning. 
using effective teaching methods. And I gave some of those strategies that can be used. Um, main one, differentiating is essential um, when talking about you know, teaching methods. Differentiation, something that's also important is just utilizing more inclusion in the classroom and um you know doing some improvement a teacher who has never taught a gifted child definitely needs to um sharpen skills so that they can reach the gifted child where they are another thing is at home parents um, families community church organizations should allow students to engage in meaningful conversations and socialization to continue to build their skills and provide opportunities for them to develop their creativity and their talent. It's also important to create opportunities for them to problem solve and make decisions. Encourage their curiosity and reinforce their interests. So when they're showing interest in probably the art or interest in reading, or interest in dancing or in sports or intellectual interests make sure you're giving them the, up that opportunity to build on those interests those skills so something that was said early and i realized though is that for students who are demonstrated giftedness in sports and in arts and in uh, music those students often are encouraged by society more and by parents more and you know what we need to do is to ensure that we have a level ground for giftedness so students who are intellectually gifted and students who are excelling intellectually we need to create more avenues for them to grow and to um, sharpen their skills and encourage their skills so that's something that we need to do more as well. Um, teach the child to resist peer pressure or resist conforming um, to peer pressure. Um, teachers should modify the curriculum as well as, and we talked about modification earlier, the UDL approach is excellent. Uh, provide individual student recognition and attention provide individual support and encouragement to improve their self-esteem, very important. Um, provide opportunity for the student to participate in projects, research, internships, and seminars. So feed the student with the knowledge that they crave. Um, allow them to use the intellect that they have. So give them these opportunities to go out there, to be involved in different projects and be involved in seminars and, you know, produce work as well, do research and go share presentations. You know, give them those opportunities, those platform to let their work or their skills be demonstrated and be recognized. And then it's very important to note, and I think I said it somewhat earlier, is that though a child is gifted and talented, it does not mean that they are exceptional in all areas. In some areas, they perform similar to their same age peers or even below. And so it's common that gifted and talented students, even though they're gifted and talented, their social emotional needs are similar to those of their peers and they often need continued social emotional support, similarly to their same age peers. So that's something that is very important to note um, as we move forward. And then, as we are coming to the end of the presentation, it's important that we take action and we advocate. And one of the main thing that I am seeing and I need to be more vocal about or I need to advocate more about is the disparities between um, races as it relates to giftedness. What I'm seeing here, especially in Illinois, is that white and Asian students are considered gifted more often than 
um, black and Hispanic students. So that disparity is concerning and I feel that more work should be done to ensure that all students are receiving equitable services and supports. And so other matters that action and advocacy are needed in are um, gifted and talented students who receive acceleration and enrichment are more successful than those students who are denied such opportunity. So more advocacy is needed to lobby for all students to receive equitable services. Doesn't matter their age, the country they're from, their race, their gender, their sexuality, all students should be given supports that they need so that they can reach their fullest potential. And so that's something that I want to do more work in, ensuring that there is equity and ensuring that social justice is provided for all students. It's also important from your part, for you parents, for you teachers, wherever country you're watching this from, to meet with your school and lobby for policies and improved services for gifted students. You need to start having conversation with your school boards, with your school leaders about what are they doing to meet the needs of these children who are gifted. Because if you ask me, some schools are trying, yes, but then there's way more to be done far more to be done in terms of connecting students with the supports that they need and getting students the support that they need. I have seen situations where students who are gifted and talented in the high school setting who are gifted and talented are not sure, are not provided, don't have resources uh, to move forward. And when compared to some similar students of different race, you know, it's a different story. So there has to be some policies to level the playing ground for these students to be provided with service equitably. And then you should ask your school, what are they doing to support your child that is gifted? Have those conversations, schedule a meeting with the principal, schedule a meeting with the counselor, schedule a meeting with however the policy, the district's procedures are and hear more about what they are doing to meet these students where they are. And then you can do your own research as well as educators and as um, teachers by, by uh, scheduling webinars or, you know, workshops um, to, um, with trained professionals to learn more about gifted education and resources. There are many websites out there um, that you can explore. The main one I'm going to leave you with is the National um, Center for Gifted and Talented, National, Cent National Association for Gifted um, Children. That's a website that you definitely could um, benefit from some resources in. But do your research, look for resources, and definitely start doing your part to advocate for your child, for someone else's child, to get all the supports that they need. Let us advocate for equity and let us advocate for social justice for all students. All students need to receive the services that they need so they can excel in the school setting, in the home setting, and in all settings that they are a part of. And so as we wrap up the presentation, here are some sources or here are the sources that were used as part of this presentation. Um, so you can check some of these out to get more information. And once you go to these, you will find resources within some of these websites that you can also access. So do some reading um, further from what we've talked about today and do your part to improve 
the supports for students with, ex with exceptionalities. Do your part, let's support them as best as we can um, to ensure that they too are reaching their fullest potential. And as we end, if you need more information about this presentation or if you need a copy of the presentation, you may email me at gordonzanu1 at gmail.com or you can leave a comment on the video on the platform it, in which it was shared and I will reach out to you and we can have dialogues. Um, I'll respond to comments or um, give feedback on you know matters that you may have concern about. So definitely see links below and feel free to reach out on different matters that you'd want me to present on, to talk on, so that we can ensure that our children are being met with the supports the equitable supports that they need to excel. Goodbye for now. It was a pleasure sharing with you this information on gifted learners. Feel free, as said, to reach out and continue to do your part so that we can have equity and social justice for all students. Goodbye. Take care.